That means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and we pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. We recognize and respect their cultural heritage beliefs and relationship with the land, and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and First Nations who are present. Um, apologies and leave of absence. I have an apology from Councillor Kira, an apology from uh, Councillor Moran as well. Um, it seems that we're still not at a full compliment there, but that's what I've received. Um, confirmation of the minutes. Uh, I'll seek a mover and a seconder that the minutes are a true and accurate record. Thank you, Councillor Ho, seconded Lord Mayor. Any discussion on that, members? None will go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Um, that takes us to item four, uh, which is the CEO update. And as you're aware, Claire Mockler is the acting CEO um, at the moment. So I'll pass to Claire. Uh, sorry, Claire. Uh... If we can get Claire unmuted. Yes, um, I should be unmuted. Can you hear Excellent. me? All right, so Jenny, are you going to drive, presumably? Yeah, that's probably easiest, Claire. Unless you would like me to give you the remote, I'm happy to, but... Oh, oh. I'm happy for you to... <laughs> no worries. Next slide, thanks. So, members, tonight um, Ian had scheduled uh, an overview for you of two pieces of work that he's leading, one around recover and one around the longer term opening up of the city. Um, but I thought it'd be helpful just to overlay... Um, what we're planning to do in relation to business plan and budget, because I've had a few questions from uh, members just around timing of various elements. Uh, the Minister has confirmed that uh, there'll be a new time frame um, for local government um, to adopt budgets, and that's um, likely to be November at the end of this year. Um, and so in a couple of weeks' time, um, we'll have a session with you um, to bring back through um, all the assumptions underpinning our revenue and expenditure. Um, and we'll continue to work with you to get your input into what will get delivered, um, predominantly in the first six months of the next financial year, as well as the second uh, six months of the financial year. Uh, the work that Ian's doing will also have touch points into the business plan and budget. So for example, um, if there is a project that council members want to suggest in the short term or the medium term uh, that you believe will enable the city to reopen and come back to life, then obviously there are numerous touch points through that business plan and budget process uh, for you to uh, prioritise that and allocate those fundings. Um, so I just wanted to um, show you that um, we're connecting all this internally, but the touch points around how you prioritise and how you fund are mainly through uh, the business plan and budget, which we'll continue to work with you on in the coming months. So I just wanted to uh, share that with you tonight. Um, I'll now hand over to Ian, who will go into a little bit more detail around what he's planning and what he's working on. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Um, and through the through the chair, can everyone hear me all right? Is that a thumbs up? You can hear me? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, if we can just, Jenny, go to the next slide. I just wanted to go through a few slides um, this evening um, before our workshop on the, the 19th of this month, where we can go through things in greater depth, because I'm, I'm very conscious that uh, elected members um, and your various constituent groups have views, thoughts and ideas around um, what recovery and to some degree reimagination looks like for the city. I put up a slide there and I can share this information with you anyway, but there's been a fair bit of talk about you know, recovery and when we come back, what's the city going to look like, how will it operate? And, and I wanted to put up some of these core drivers of the city economy and and just make sure everyone understands when we come back, it's not gonna be certainly initially um, how we left. If you look at some of the core drivers for the CBD, 
I've talked about international students in the past, which is the largest single export um, from South Australia. That, that will come back differently. And then you look at things like our festival, festivals and events, which are a fantastic calendar. I think it's one of the best calendars in the country around festivals and events. But if you look at the Fringe, uh, the Festival, the TDU, um, Wyoming Adelaide, Superloop, uh, International Tennis, Oz Asia, Christmas Pageant, there are a lot of unknowns um, from our perspective around what they will look like uh, next year or the next time they run the event, if they run the event at all. So we've seen the horse trials, for example, being cancelled. We've seen Tasting Australia delayed. Uh, what that looks like, uh, we're still working through with uh, the event owners in this case, in that case, um, the SATC. But I think it gives you in totality a pretty good snapshot of, you know, there's 350 odd million dollars worth of economic impact that may not look the same. And you know, 4.2 million attendees just across those events alone. Um, Adelaide Oval does about a million people a year for a game of AFL football. Um, so that doesn't include concerts and cricket. Um, but I think it's about 980 odd thousand people went to a game of AFL footy last last season. So even if football comes back, um, it's likely to be broadcast rather than necessarily, uh, you know, big crowds at Adelaide Oval. So I just wanted to give you a bit of context and make sure expectations are uh, consistent around what uh, what this return to the CBD starts to look like. Jenny, can you just go to the next slide, please? Uh, I know you've all been interested in data, so there's a little of some insights here into these are national figures about the types of expenditures that have dropped significantly during the COVID period and those that have picked up. And there's some there are some insights in there that um, I'll let you reflect on in due course, but there's some obvious ones there around places where people can't congregate or don't want to congregate, but public transport is an interesting one. Um, obviously, the education one will, will now change as a result of um, some relaxation, particularly in South Australia. Um, but cafes, um, obviously, been hit hard. And then on the other side, there's been some interesting things around pet care, um, alcohol and tobacco, uh, online retail and subscriptions, food delivery services, um, home improvement and the like. So. Not necessarily any surprises, but it's always good to have uh, good, accurate national data on, on what's actually going on in our society. Next one, please, Jenny. I think I touched on this briefly before, but um, we've got we've established our cross-portfolio team that uh, met last week and is now meeting twice weekly, uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. It's a cross-skilled cross group of people um, already getting some really good ideas and thoughts, um, which we'll continue to, to work through. We will be providing uh, regular updates to the elected members, uh, sent one through last week, and um, there will be uh, probably a weekly uh, update on, on progress to date. And if anything in particular pops up, we'll, we'll do that instantly. And we also have a range of communication channels that you may or may not be aware of to, to all of our customers. Um, Jenny, if you can go to the next. Um, and th this is, we've got some good reach out there in terms of different audiences that we can talk to. And we've got nine regular email newsletters that are but really good uh, open rates, 120,000 subscribers. Um, and if you or any of your constituents are looking to subscribe to some of these, these channels, the, the link is there for you. Um, on top of that, our website gets about 1.5 million unique users uh, a year. So again, uh, compared to media outlets and some of the other channels where people consume their information, um, I'd suggest that uh, our channels are as good, if not uh, deeper and richer than quite a few of those. Thanks, Jenny. Um, quick update on where we're at with UPark Plus, which I know there's been a lot of interest in that. Now 6,200 registered users. Um, we're seeing a few more people obviously coming back into the CBD um, and more activation of those user cards, which is great. So our ability to start to use this platform for park and play or park and visit whatever those uh, offers might be once uh, um, there is some relaxation and opening of um, more establishments in the CBD, we've got a great way of communicating special offers to, to people to try and stimulate. Um, the golf course is reopened, which is great, um, under some restricted arrangements around um, uses of carts and obviously our food and beverage offering is more just pick up and collect, you can't go in through the clubhouse, but hopefully that will start to, to ease as well. Um, We've been doing, um, the team, we've been doing some regular wellbeing calls to uh, Commonwealth Housing Support Program residents, um, which has been great. Um, over 100 city residents have received food hampers through the, the Good Social Cafe. Um, we've linked residents to local grocers and places that are open. Um, the central markets have 
done, uh, a range of the operators at the central markets have got home delivery services. And there's been a pre-order and collect service, which um, Jody and some of the team here out of CLC have been supporting. And I think there've been over 600 orders, uh, food orders since the 9th of April. So that's been a, a relatively new initiative, but I'm conscious of some of the commentary in the media around um, initiatives that other councils have put in play. Um, I think what we're doing in the we're just making sure you've got line of sight to all the, the excellent things I think this organisation has been doing um, off its own bat to make sure people in need are receiving the services and uh, access to, to things that they do need. On more of the strategic partnership front, which is again something you asked uh, of us to make sure we we're checking in and, and, and leveraging partnerships. Um, only in the last week or so, myself, the Lord Mayor and others, we've had some direct online meetings with the AHA restaurants and catering, um, the South Australian Tourism Commission, so with their chair and CEO, and, and really reaching out to them to let them know that as these things change, we are looking to partner. And so we need to do some work on that now um, in advance of, of when the, uh, the, the medical advice comes through. All of those calls have been received really well. Um, and there's a real willingness and understanding that the CBD is different. I think one of the challenges, particularly for the visitor economy in, in Adelaide will be the borders are likely to say, uh, or a, a soft return to, to interstate travel and probably a longer term to international travel. So the push will be on South Australians holidaying in South Australia. And so you can see, uh, you know, river, uh, houseboats on the river, shacks, um, camping, uh, all those sorts of experiences are likely to be pushed pretty hard. And so the CBD offering, which has often been around events and festivals, what does that start to look like? So I think we're going to need to, to reimagine a little bit about that offering um, and how we ensure social distancing and, and opening of cafes, restaurants, and how we can maximise um, the opportunity for, for, for businesses to trade. Um, we Fortunately, we've done some work previously around the My Adelaide campaign, which I've talked about. That's pretty much ready to go now. So we're, we're sitting on that for when the time is right to be rolled out, subject to a health announcement. That will be about some of that message will definitely be about um, safety. There's a bit of research floating around that talks about people traveling, but the safety issue is the key driver, followed then by reconnecting. So we need to be mindful of how we message uh, a return to the city, um, but we've got some great assets to activate through the My Adelaide campaign. Um, business SA, we're just finalizing a business SA agreement, um, which will be looking at a whole raft of services that they offer. Um, some of these will be FOC to city businesses and and some will be um, subsidised through us and some may be a, a small contribution. But they range from mental health services through to online distribution to industrial relations, a whole raft of, of, of tailored programs that we're going to roll out specifically for City of Adelaide businesses. Also been some additional engagement with Renew Adelaide. So as you know, we obviously fund them. And I think to Claire's point earlier on, um, as we bring in um, annual business plan and, and funding partners, uh, whether there's an enhanced role here for a new Adelaide um, around um, vacancies within the CBD. And then last night for those who are available, a number of people did um, log in. We had a, a forum with about 65 people around the citywide business model, which is a, a core initiative in, our, um, in the strategic plan that we will implement a citywide business model. Um, last night uh, on the hookup, I certainly heard unequivocally um, a push from businesses to get on with it and and to to drive this change. So that's what I'd call a reimagine piece where the, the functionality of our current economic development, um, marketing and and uh, events pieces would be would be looked at in a different light um, with a view to uh, a new body that uh, does represent the interests of, of businesses across the CBD and does drive drive initiatives. So Got a fair bit of really good feedback last night and, and some pointed feedback around types of things they want to see. So we're bringing that in on the 19th of, of May as well in a, in a workshop format. Um, so the next steps, um, as I've said, the, the regular updates to elected members. We're, we're just developing a new online web-based tool too that, that helps the community engage with our strat plan and this um, um, return to the CBD and recover pro project. Um, conscious too that elected members are looking for ways they can contribute. There are many ways to do that. Obviously you can just contact us direct, but 
also looking for a new online platform that uh, gives you and your constituents the opportunity to contribute and provide ideas and also for staff, particularly our frontline staff who are out on the ground interfacing with the public because they have some excellent intel and we need to tap into some of those ideas that they're hearing firsthand. So we'll bring all of that together um, and do a bit of a walkthrough on some of these new, uh, new initiatives on the 19th of May. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Ian. Well, you've changed to Claire, but um, thank you nonetheless. I'll just open it up for quick questions on that one, if there are any, bearing in mind that um, we do need to get through the rest of the agenda. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I, I noted our actions in helping people, regular wellbeing calls made to 200 CHSP uh, residents and over um, 100 hampers delivered through Good Social Cafe. Both of those were our initiatives or are they other organisations? Would you, can I answer that? Okay, yeah, I'm happy to, but if you want to, Christy, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Claire, you go ahead. Okay, I'm going to say go, Christy. <laughs> She's gone. Um, so um, it's work that we that we do. So when it comes to the Commonwealth um, program, we do that. Um, we get grant funding from the Commonwealth to deliver. So that's work that we do and that our staff do. Um, in relation to the um, food hampers, we partner with Good Social Cafe to deliver that. So at that point in time, our staff weren't able to be necessarily on the ground. And so we partnered with that group to deliver that program. Um, Christy, did you have anything further to add? No, that's right. I just wanted to be clear. Those um, 200 CHISP clients are actually ours that the City of Adelaide look after. And so we've had um, ongoing communication and newsletters and check-in with them over the last five weeks, six weeks. Uh, how much are we paid for doing that? Is it a total 100% Commonwealth funded thing? Yes, it is. Right. And uh, the hampers, did we contribute any money or staff to that? We didn't. We contributed coordination and encouragement for it to happen, though we were able, we were looking to make a quick return grant available if they needed it, and they didn't. They had charity support. Okay. And um, in relation to the My Adelaide campaign, uh, I'm unclear about that. Is that the campaign that the Lord Mayor announced on the 10th of March to encourage people to dine and socialise in the City of Adelaide, or is that a different one? Uh, oh, sorry, can you, you can hear me? Yep. Um, yeah, that, that's the a campaign that we announced, but it's obviously been reconfigured. We put that on hold um, as COVID evolved uh, globally, and so we are still using the, the bones, I suppose, of that campaign um, in terms of the hashtag and some of the assets that we've developed, uh, particularly digital assets, but the messaging, as I indicated in my presentation, would be different. It would involve a stronger focus on safety, and then as as uh, conditions are relaxed, how that's communicated. So when you say safety, uh, the original plan was to encourage people to spend time shopping, dining and socialising. You'll be um, promoting how you can do that in a, um, um, a mandated socially distant fashion, or something something different. Yeah, no, that's that's the that's the the intent. It's the primary message will be safety. The secondary message about if if relaxation around restaurants and cafes and activations of public spaces, um, how people can do that, and what the city has to offer in relation to that. Oh, I think that'd be a marked improvement on the other one. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Noel. Okay, uh, just a quick one. When I looked at the, uh, we talked about the economic drivers, etc. And I think if we're going to, if we talk about those sort of, uh, the, you know, the three levels, because I think we, we purely using the events, etc. And we're using that as part of, of uh, a drive for the economy, but it is, it is actually a return mainly for the greater uh, uh, Adelaide rather than necessarily the city. And I just think when we talk about drivers for our city, we do need to start talking about the, the three different economies, that is the daytime, evening and nighttime economies, so that we are looking at each of them 
so that we can, uh, uh, you know, specialize some of the, the uh, things that we're trying, initiatives, so that we are addressing each of them because they all have an integral part to play. And the, obviously the interaction and so the nighttime and the, and the, the evening uh, economies are, are built upon the daytime. And I think it's just, we've got to be a little bit careful because these raw numbers, a lot of them don't involve too much about the city, except maybe some restaurants and things. Whereas we need a more intimate uh, relationship with the people that visit the city. And we need to be a bit more clear about what that looks like because they're the ones who are suffering the most and who are going to need the most help. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Um, any other questions on that? If not, we will go to 4.2, which is an update on homelessness. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Uh, good evening through the chair. I'd, I'll give you a verbal update um, as to where the City of Adelaide is in relation to rough sleeping and then touch on the Adelaide Zero project. Um, the SA Housing, Housing Authority continues to lead the response to ensure the safety of people experiencing homelessness, in particular rough sleepers, sleepers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Adelaide Zero facilitates weekly COVID response meetings for the sector uh, via Zoom on a Friday. This is where the government services and all the related organisations, including the City of Adelaide, come together to raise any issues regarding the service delivery and housing during the pandemic. It's been very effective. And as of Friday the 1st of May, there were 303 people in hotels and motels as part of the response, that's last Friday. These, there are also people in emergency accommodation crisis care, and you may have seen the number in the media of 500. That's where that number comes from. Each of these people are being supported by homelessness services. Flu vaccinations are being rolled out to those who want them and hygiene packs are being distributed. Focus is now transitioning to people uh, getting people into long-term secure housing. This is a commitment of the SA Housing Authority. They're leading it and um, they're allocating their properties as appropriate. Additional funding for case management and support has been provided to lead the Specialist Homelessness Services Program. The latest Adelaide, Dash, uh, project, Adelaide Zero Project dashboard did, however, record 99 people still actually actively sleeping rough in our city. Additional analysis is being undertaken to better explore this number. It may be that they uh, do not wish to take up the hotel option. Um, and there may be less than this actual, actual number. It's a number that they've reported, but it's being investigated. In relation to the capital city of uh, Lord Mayor's homelessness and, and housing working group, representatives meet each week to share the city's responses to homelessness and rough sleeping. And the working group is developing an approach to capture this responses from the homelessness to each city. There's currently a survey being conducted across each city so we can actually have some data that I can present to you. Um, this, of course, we're also looking at um, submissions to the capital city Lord Mayors from the capital city of Lord Mayors to the federal inquiry into homelessness when that reconvenes. And finally, I'd like to touch on um, articles in the media today to clarify the, the funding confusion around the Don Dunstan Foundation and the Adelaide Zero Project. The City of Adelaide has a strategic partnership with the Don Dunstan Foundation to, to deliver project coordination for the Adelaide Zero Project. That funding ends on December the 30, 31st this year. The value of this partnership is $383,880 $383, over three years. We recognise the important and well-executed work that the Don Dunstan Foundation is doing and have not withdrawn funding. Thanks to a motion by the Deputy Lord Mayor last year, an additional 200,000 was budgeted for the 1920 financial year to implement the recommendations of the Dame Louise Casey report, contingent on the state government funding the rest. The state government did not commit to funding the remaining recommendations, but did agree to co-fund a feasibility study for inner city services coordination at $45,000. We therefore have matched their $45,000 and that project is underway. Uh, we're on the steering committee. Furthermore, from the $200,000, Council provided $60,000 to the Adelaide Zero Project to progress work on supporting Aboriginal, mobile Aboriginal communities. There's $95,000 remaining of the additional of that $200,000 that does not have a new decision in order to allocate it. As this remained unspent for the year, it was provided as a potential saving to Council, considering our budget implications for COVID-19. COVID 
This does not signal an intent to change anything about our significant work with the Adelaide Zero project and should be seen simply as unallocated funds. For what it's worth, I'd like to point out that the sector, the whole sector is working extremely well together, led in part by the Don Dunstan Foundation and has used the pandemic to achieve outcomes that may have otherwise have taken several years in, in other circumstances. So I hope that clarifies um, recent confusion around the Don Dunstan Foundation funding and I'm happy to take any questions, of course. Thank you for that, Christy. Do we have any questions on that? Councillor Sims, you're unmuted. Thanks, um, Deputy Lord Mayor, and thank you, uh, Christy, for that update. I um, appreciate that. Look, just on the um, Don Dunstan um, funding matter, just so that I can be very clear. So the amount of money that's being um, talked about as a potential uh, reduction in the papers that we're going to look at later, that is the um, $100,000 remaining that was contingent um, on state government matching it. And the proposal from administration is because the state government didn't match it, therefore it go back into the pool. Is that That's correct? That's correct. The state government didn't match the $200,000 ask for those recommendations. So we've actually allocated $100,000 of it, roughly, for two other projects and the remaining $100,000 to be returned. Okay, by way of feedback, um, when this was initially proposed um, by Councillor um, Hyde uh, last year, the, the $200,000, um, I moved an amendment to say that it should be uh, non-contingent um, on state government uh, support um, and that we should allocate the um, funding uh, regardless of what the state government do. Um, that position uh, was um, opposed um, by the majority on council. Um, so that's why we, we find ourselves in the position um, that we're in at the moment. But my view is that we should still uh, proceed with allocating the full amount um, because, um, you know, there is a, a pressing need, I think, um, to uh, support um, the city's homeless um, in, uh, in the city at this time. Um, I welcome the Deputy Lord Mayor's support for that position um, in the media today. Um, so, you know, I look forward to discussing it further at Council um, next week. Members, any further questions? Was that, was that, was that a yes? Oh, you do have your hand up. My apologies. We will um, unmute you, Phil. There you go. Thank you very much. And yes, look, I endorse uh, those comments of, uh, of Rob's and uh, I'm grateful too that the Deputy Lord Mayor will see that that money uh, is through a motion on the floor of council allocated to the homeless. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I do have a question, though, about the way in which that money was spent. And there were two projects that uh, Christy mentioned. Could, could you repeat what those were again? Sorry. Yes, certainly. Uh, there was $45,000 uh, that is currently uh, being looked at for a... I'll just read exactly what it is so that there's no confusion there. Um, it's, it's a project that's co-funding an inner city services coordination project. So it's looking at, um, it, it, it's effectively looking at coordinated services, whatever that, whether that be a virtual or, or physical hub, $45,000 each. And we're just looking at appointing a consultant uh, at the moment to undertake that work. The other amount was $60,000 for the Adelaide Zero project to um, progress work on supporting mobile Aboriginal communities. And that work is also underway. Okay, uh, now in respect of the first one, um, is that a services for homeless? Yes, oh absolutely, ultimately it's um, I guess taking recommendations that were, were in the Dame Casey report to look at the best way we can uh, coordinate services for homeless people. A and in respect of the latter one, mobile Aboriginal uh, community support, is that for uh, Aboriginal or members of Aboriginal communities who are homeless in the city of Adelaide? Yes, I understand it is directed at um, communities that are sleeping rough uh, in the city of Adelaide. 
And so that's a separate if allocation. If I could just add, sorry, Chair, if I could just add, it was in, um, also in relation to um, work um, that was um, already underway as part of um, homelessness and sleeping rough, which was to um, help um, understand the um, mobility challenges that the city experiences from Aboriginal communities that aren't necessarily um, requiring a roof over their head here in the city. They're down here for other reasons. They come seasonally. Um, and so there had been a commitment um, through the Adelaide Zero project for some period of time to start to look at that. Um, and the Anglicare initiative um, had already been underway to help um, they were taking the lead on it, um, and, and and that work um, is underway. So, uh, was this the um, uh, uh, the issue related to um, Aboriginal drinking in the city? There's no mention specifically of alcohol in this particular no. project. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, members, any other questions on that? Um, I just want to make a, a, a quick comment. Um, uh, was that a hand up, Rob? Yes? Okay. All right. Uh, give us a sec. Um, uh, and that comment would be that the way that I structured the motion, um, I always had intended for the entirety of the funding to be unlocked. Um, uh, so long as there was a contribution from the state government, it wasn't necessarily 50-50. Um, uh, that's just by the by. The other thing I just wanted to ask um, Christy, uh, with regards to the accommodation that the state government have been providing, I've been hearing anecdotally from people who have been in the accommodation who and who have subsequently left the accommodation, that there are um, quite significant safety concerns. Um, uh, a lot of people are feeling unsafe uh, around some of the other people that have been put in that accommodation. Um, and I'm also getting reports of hotel rooms um, uh, being, well, for want of a better word, destroyed um, by the people that are being put in the accommodation. So I was just wondering, have you heard any reports of that? And, and do you have anything to update us with um, on that? I, I can, um, yes, during our Friday catch-ups, there are from time to time updates in relation to the fact that um, there are some people with complex needs and in hotel motel accommodation hasn't suited everyone. In fact, there's quite considerable work with case managers to make sure they are being housed appropriately. So there has been some movement and now there are 23 hotels and motels involved. And as I understand, they're being paid fully, of course, through the state government for their for the use of their premises and also for any anything that may happen. But it's certainly a minority um, of people that are that are that are, ha that are having issues issues in relation to that. And, and of course, um, you know, these people are, are, ex are extremely vulnerable and some of them do have complex issues. So from time to time, there are issues. Thanks. And could you give us an indication of the sorts of mental health services that are wrapped around? Um, because obviously the, the root of much of this is a mental health um, issue, so. Yes, well, all health services are wrapped around this at this stage. So we are, um, a case manager is, working with every um, person that's being allocated uh, accommodation. And then that triages into what kind of services they need. So everything that is available through um, our health services is available to these people at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, Rob, a further question? Thanks. And look, thanks for um, your clarification of your uh, intention um, last year, Deputy Lord Mayor. That wasn't clear to me at the time. Um, and I remember the discussion about it. Um, but I, I, um, I think that's great if that's the position that you now hold. Um, and uh, yeah, we definitely let's work together on that. Um, but in terms of um, the the broader um, response, um, Christy, I'm just wondering if there's a time frame that the government that they are working towards in terms of being able to provide people with long term accommodation. Are the government actually in the process of building new social housing uh, in terms of ensuring that these people moved, are those that are currently being housed in temporary accommodation are moved into something permanent? And when will they be um, making that information available to the public? Because I'm getting lots of um, 
constituents contacting me and concerned about what is happening to people who are um, homeless in the city at this time. And um, it'd be really good if the government could give some clarity around that. Perhaps that's something we can um, ask directly for through, um, through, through council. However, I can tell you that their intention is to be, it will take some weeks, of course, um, 303 people is a lot. And as I understand, they're, they're actively working at about roughly around um, 10 people a week, which also is a lot. So that will take some weeks. However, that's unconfirmed. That's it's really um, up to them to be uh, providing you with this information. So, if you like, we can um, uh, seek some actual statement from them. Yeah, that that'd be really helpful. Thank you. I, I'd appreciate that. Um, just because I think that clarity would be would be really useful, and um, and in particular to give people a sense of what time frame is being um, being worked towards. That that'd be really good to know. There is an absolute commitment to move everyone from hotels into appropriate housing. Great. No, that, that's really good. Um, and uh, another quick um, question. Um, earlier, uh, earlier, in, earlier this year or late last year, time is kind of moving at a very strange pace at the moment. There was a, um, a council undertook to start to develop a policy position to um, encourage more social housing in the city. And that was contingent on the state government um, undertaking uh, their um, policy work. Um, was argued at the time by myself that we should do ours, but um, there was a push to wait until the state government did theirs. I'm just wondering where that um, work is up to and, and whether um, what's happening at the moment ties in with, with that policy and, and broader strategy. Thank you for that. I will actually need to check historical facts and come back to you. However, I can tell you that, of course, the new strategic plan includes thriving communities and a commitment to zero functional homelessness currently. And of course, therefore, work is being focused on that, both um, in respect to what will now happen with COVID-19 response and um, what our intention might be and what um, the focus will be for, for the future. But in relation to um, what you've asked about previously, I, I'm afraid I'll have to take that on notice, sorry. Yeah, that's totally fine. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Members, any further questions on homelessness? Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you. Um, and look, I thank the administration for making the point that uh, people in accommodation at this time, hotels and motels are often um, uh, uh, suffering from really complex mental health issues. Um, it is not something new. In, in fact, um, in hostel accommodation, for example, um, it is often a very um, uh, grave issue um, for the operators of hostels to deal with. But uh, I am particularly, and I'm sure the, uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor didn't mean to demonise uh, the homeless by saying that there have been reports of rooms being wrecked. Um, just in the interest of making sure that uh, this um, isn't conflated to mean something else, can you give us an idea of just how many rooms have been wrecked? 50%, 10%, 2%? I can't give you exact numbers, but I can tell you it's, it's minor. It's not um, something that's being talked about regularly on a weekly basis. On the contrary, some uh, stories in relation to the progress and um, pride of people having a, a bed for... Um, for the first time is actually over, over overcoming discussions of, of other issues. But um, I, um, again, we could get specifics for you, but I can tell you it's certainly not, certainly not 50%. And um, it's not an issue that's being talked about significantly. Well, look, if it's possible, it would be great to have the figures, uh, you know, these things do get out of control. So that would be really good and help you deal with that. Thanks, Christy. And of course, not to conflate um, Councillor Martin verbaling me, as per my line of questioning, the line of questioning was there to uh, highlight the fact that these are mental health issues. Um, that was the second question that I asked. Um, and it was the third question that I asked as well. So that was the reasoning there. Um, but thank you, Councillor Martin, for clarifying. We always do appreciate your clarity on these matters. Um, with that, members, we'll move to 5.1, uh, which is the Environmental Health Management Policy. Um, and I'm going to take that one as read. 
Um, but I'll ask if there's any questions or discussion on this one. Let me just get my participants up. Councillor Martin. Welcome back. Just a couple of things I had trouble following uh, reading the report and I'd be very grateful if the administration could just help me to understand it. Um, uh, the policy document itself is, is very short and I note that it refers to specific activities like body piercing and uh, talks about the need for intervention in terms of a public health policy. But there's nothing in there about the standards. I mean, so that, you know, a body piercing outlet would understand what was expected of them. Is there another document somewhere that sits um, beside this and provides that specific direction so that everybody understands? Uh, Vanessa's here, so she'll be able to talk you through that, Councillor. Vanessa? Yeah. Hi, Hi. Councillor Matt. Oh, sorry, turn it on. Yeah. Apologies for the, um, for the noise, um, and thank you for the question, Councillor Martin, through the chair. Um, the policy outlines um, the, the context within which the City of Adelaide operates and all of the standards are set by the state government. And so um, that's why they're not included in our policy. Great, thank you. And just one other uh, question. Um, one of the principles of the Australian standard on which this document um, is uh, constructed um, says that the cornerstone of this is to ensure that um, stakeholders have a shared view um, and we haven't done that. Do we need to do that? Is there a need for a consultation in line with the, the standard that's recommended or is there some reason why this document is exempt? Um, through the chair, we, we don't believe that consultation is required for this policy, given that um, the policy is, is the is really just outlining, it's the formal document that's outlining the context for the City of Adelaide um, and the framework and the guidelines and the legislation are set and not negotiable. Um, and so we don't believe that it requires public consultation for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, members, any other questions? No hand, virtual or otherwise. Excellent. Thank you, Vanessa. We'll move to item 5.2, which is the temporary revisions to community consultation policy in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And I'll be taking that one as read as well. Any questions or discussion on this, members? No, I thought it was pretty straightforward as well. Um, all right. Thank you, Catherine, for coming. And with that, we come to 5.3, the 2019-20 quarter three financial and performance report. And I'll be passing to the acting CEO, Claire. Um, thank you, Chair. And I should also just mention, I'll say a few words. I should also mention that David Powell, uh, Chair of our Audit Committee um, is also here. Um, and he too will say a few words once I finish before handing back to the chair to obviously answer um, any questions that, that you might have. So six, since the 16th of March, um, I think we've briefed you five times, held a special council meeting to talk you through how best to mitigate the financial impact that the city and the organisation's been experiencing um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, we've shared with you that the City of Adelaide is unique compared to other South Australian local governments in terms of the mix of our um, revenue stream and we're certainly more akin to other capital cities who've also experienced similar pain um, over the last few weeks. Um, our commercial and community uh, facilities have been shut and in addition we've obviously experienced um, a sharp drop in our on-street parking revenue and our revenue in our youth parks as well. Um, and so the other important element that sort of underpins the approach that we've taken at QF3 is the fact since 2017-18 we have been operating um, with a deficit the past two financial years. 
Um, and regardless of whether we had um, COVID-19 or not, I would have been working closely with you um, as you were building next year's business plan and budget to work out how we um, shift from um, having an underlying operating deficit to a more sustainable financial, um, long-term financial plan approach. Um, so tonight, what you have now is a culmination um, of um, all the elements uh, that we talked you through over the past few weeks um, and um, some recommendations for you to consider um, and um, give us your feedback and thoughts on. Um, in terms of the actual report itself, you'll see that it's quite a different look and feel. Um, we had a KPMG internal order report um, that um, was considered by our audit committee in January. Um, and the feedback had been consistently shared that um, how we present our financial information needs to be in a way that helps the audience ask the right questions and have transparency around where our um, current financial position is at. So separate to the content of the report, um, I'll be keen to get your thoughts and feedback. Um, you don't need to do that tonight, but certainly offline would be helpful um, on the look and feel and what you found helpful from an um, understanding perspective and what you'd like more or less of. Um, if you feel inclined to give feedback, um, our audit committee received the same report last Friday and gave us some uh, really good feedback just around how we structure the information, making sure dashboard, dashboard information is you know, visible um, and perhaps brought uh, forward in the report to help council have a good picture of our finances. Um, so in relation um, to where we're at, um, obviously council endorsed uh, that support package. So that's been included at QF. Um, we have modelled that and um, we're also um, noting and making adjustments based on the actual drop in income to the end of March. And I should just say um, that the work we were doing um, to look at that through to the end of June is still underway. Um, obviously, what we're showing tonight is an income drop to the end of March. We've still got April, May and potentially June still to consider. Um, and then on the expenditure side, um, what we've done um, around the projects, um, those are the strategic projects um, that Council uh, does each year, um, only 300k of those um, uh, savings are being offered up. Um, and the reality is some of those projects could not be delivered in relation to some of the um, timings associated with those strategic projects, such as the cultural entrepreneurs that took a lot of face to face time. So obviously we can't deliver that in this environment. Um, you'll notice that our prudential, um, that our um, borrowings are um, now going down slightly, but I should just say that is as a result of the recent council de decision asking us to um, also um, find 20 million in savings in our general operations. So that's now been modelled in the long term financial plan. And so while the borrowing limits are decreasing to 17.9.3, um, we do think that in the coming weeks and months, depending on what our revenue looks like and depending on uh, the capacity um, of council to consider projects associated with Reimagine, um, we will need to explore increasing our prudential borrowing limits. The report does touch on the fact that um, that's a policy, a treasury policy consideration. Um, we have set aside um, a session to talk you through what that could mean on the 26th of May. So. On the 26th of May, we'll have a workshop with you. It will pick up what the uh, budget could look like next year um, and also um, what sort of borrowing limits you might want to undertake. Um, Clinton did talk you through the projects that he was recommending were either retimed or carry forward or deferred. Um, and Clinton's here with me tonight and can certainly provide you more insight and detail um, into those individual projects. Um, I, I get that some of the language may have been confusing. So um, the challenge around QF3 is normally now we'd be coming uh, to you with um, much more sort of tangible data around uh, where the um, quarter four was looking and asking you to have a look at 
um, what those carry forwards could look like. And we've called those retimed. So things that are reprioritized, retimed. That doesn't mean we're not doing them. It just means either capacity wise, um, we wouldn't be able to deliver it this financial year. Um, or um, certainly um, what we'll have is a, a, a comprehensive um, program for you to have a look at in the coming weeks. Obviously, a lot of that will be subject to um, how you prioritize uh, your funding in the, in the coming weeks. Um, so that's pretty, pretty much the report. I think it captures everything um, that we um, are proposing. Um, we're really open for your feedback and thoughts. If there are things that you know, I've heard loud and clear that you want to still have that mon money for Don Dunscombe Foundation, then we can look at ways um, of how we might make, make that happen. Um, I'd now like to just hand over to David to say a few words. Thank you, David. Thanks, Claire, and thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, for the opportunity for me to say a few words tonight to the elected members um, following our audit committee meeting uh, last Friday, uh, where I did offer to present more regularly than perhaps the annual uh, um, reporting that I do uh, on the audit committee's comments regarding the financial position of the council. Um, there's no doubt that COVID-19 has had a significant impact, particularly on the income of the council over the past few months. Uh, and that was on the back of several years of large deficits that, that will have an impact on the long-term financial sustainability for council and needing to take appropriate action around that. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the decisions made by council to support commercial um, tenants and residents during this time and the work of the administration to identify and implement some significant cost savings and some short and medium term changes to capital projects to assist in managing that COVID impact. Um, clearly, uh, we have been taking action. The um, One of the things we'll be talking about last week at Council, uh, sorry, the Audit Committee, was that the shutdowns um, and working from home have necessitated a number of changes to services delivered by council. Uh, and we've been recommending that the administration definitely use these lessons learned uh, from this, this shutdown or changes to services to consider uh, ways many of these services are delivered and, and maybe opportunities for cost savings going forward, which we think is also a very positive thing, uh, if there are positive things out of COVID. Um, the audit committee has been expressing concern over the past six months in the quality of um, previous financial reporting to both the audit committee and to the elected members. And uh, tonight you will be receiving a, a revised format for the quarter three financial and performance report, which has been, been prepared by the administration um, that incorporates a number of our comments that we've uh, been raising over that time. Um, I, my opinion or in the opinion of the committee is, is of the audit committee is that um, this revised format goes a long way in bringing greater clarity to the financial performance of council, which we think is a very positive thing. Um, we're very keen as independent members of the audit committee um, for the elected members to have an enhanced understanding of the finances, because uh, we believe that will greatly assist you in making informed decisions regarding budgets uh, rate decisions, operating capital budgets, and the level of debt going forward. Uh, they're all important considerations and decisions that Council makes. I'd like to particularly draw to your attention page 15 of the report, uh, which shows traffic lights on key financial ratios. It was one of the ones that um, Claire just mentioned, perhaps you could, we suggested might be brought forward in that report, because um, it reflects the financial sustainability of Council over the next 10 years. And I'd like to draw your attention to the red and yellow cells that we believe should elicit questions from elected members, particularly around operating surplus and asset sustainability ratios. So you actually understand the, the impact of, of those kind of um, decisions that we make and, and impact that has on our financial sustainability and performance. They certainly need to be considered uh, when agreeing budget parameters for the 2021 budget. Appreciate that that may have been that will be delayed um, this year, um, but knowing that any decisions you make today has a bearing on the future as well um, and future uh, the next 10 years. Um, we've been meeting as a committee uh, more regularly this year. 
uh, on the back of COVID um, as being a, a significant financial impact to the council. Uh, and um, the independent members have been certainly bringing great insights from our audit co committee experiences um, with other councils, uh, state government departments and other business activities that we're involved with. Um, happy to uh, take any questions or um, in your hands, Chair, on, on how you want to operate from here. Thank you, David. Really appreciate that update. And um, of course, for making yourself available at this uh, interesting time. Um, members, uh, obviously, David and uh, or the Deputy CEO or Acting CEO will take uh, questions. Um, if you can just make it clear who your question is to. Uh, Councillor Sims first. Thank you. Thanks, um, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you both, uh, David and Claire. And um, uh, thank you uh, to the team that have worked on this, because I imagine it would have been a lot of work to, to go through all this. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, my questions are actually uh, more for the acting CEO um, or the staff team about some of the um, particular initiatives that are mentioned in the report um, for deferral. Is is now the right time for me to ask those questions, Chair? Uh, I consider it's appropriate. If it's in the QF right. report, then... Yep. yep. Look, one of the um, areas that uh, where there are significant... And I've got three different um, areas that I want to focus on. One of those where there's um, uh, mentioned deferral is in the climate change initiatives. I think there was quite a considerable amount of money that's not being allocated there. Um, can I just drill down on exactly exactly what it is that's going to be um, put on ice, uh, so to speak, and, and how long for and what the implications are of that? So, um, Councillor Sims, I'll just need to um, drill down and just find that information two secs, please. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry, I haven't got the hard copy in front of me. Just for the benefit of everyone, Rob, was that which page was that on? I haven't. I'm sorry, I haven't got it. I've written it I down on my notes, but page yeah, five. I haven't. Pa did someone say page five? Yeah, I did. I think it's page five. Ah, thanks, David. Um, on the quarter changes project variances, climate That's change it. action initiative fund. So Is that the way down. Yeah, councillor, it's a 25 reduction to the overall commitment of, I think, around 1.6 mil. Yeah. Um, so it's a 25K reduction. Um, and so I don't think it means that we're stopping anything. So according to the notes here, um, commitments to all the activities that were um, committed to at the start of the financial year will be delivered on. Um, so uh, my understanding is it's just a 25K reduction. But how's that saving being made, just in terms of shaving some off the top, or is there a particular project that won't be happening? I'd, I'd need to clarify whether there's a project that's not happening, um, but um, I, I, my understanding from reading these notes is that um, all the commitments are being delivered, but I will get a breakdown for you um, prior to the council meeting next Tuesday on the individual projects associated um, with that funding. Um, and uh, find out why they um, are proposing uh, not to spend $25,000. Thanks, Claire. The other one I wanted to ask about is pedestrian safety at um, Whitmore Square. That might be one for um, Clinton if, if he's there. Hey, Clinton. Hi, how are you going, Councillor? Thanks. Good, good. Uh, look, I. Just wanted to clarify the um, status of that. Um, I, I guess from my perspective, I'm a bit concerned to see that that money has not been allocated because uh, it has been talked um, about for some time um, and there's a lot of uh, concern from residents about safety mm -hmm. in that area. Um, and so I'm just keen to understand why the money hasn't been spent in, in this financial year because I thought it was already allocated for and, and should have been progressed. Yeah, through the chair, the money was um, definitely allocated um, back in July 2019. Um, the team have been working on the design since that time. Uh, 
leading into the last three months, we were geared up to start delivering on the ground. Um, there were some delays to that design process um, that we've experienced in the last couple of months. The reality of that budget would have been that it would have been considered for a carry forward anyway. So the way that we're planning on treating that budget is re-timing that budget into the first quarter of next financial year for delivery on the ground. So there's no cancellation of the project. The project will continue. It's just simply, we've just simply shifted the start of construction um, by a few months into next financial year. So in real terms, that means that it would be a delay of 12 months in terms of that, that pedestrian safety initiative being completed? Uh, through the chair, I think um, in terms of the master plan, following the master plan, we did have to go into a detailed design phase around those safety improvements. So there was always going to be a period of time <coughs> required to land the design. So um, I wouldn't say a 12 month delay, but it, it has taken a little bit longer than we'd expected. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other question was around the East West Bikeway. Is that one for you, Clinton? Uh, yes, it is. Um, so I noted um, in the report, the allocation is uh, zero in terms of um, for this uh, financial year. Um, We've got the, the deed from the state government, obviously, that we've got to um, comply with. What, what is the status of that? Um, and, you know, what does this mean in terms of uh, long-term bikeways in the city? I guess my um, view is that now it is an important time to start work on bikeways in the city because we know that people are reducing their use of public transport. Um, and, uh, you know, social distancing and so on means that we actually need more bikeways um, in the city. It's a safe and healthy way for people to get around. So I understand it's been a difficult one for the council to work through, but I am concerned about it, further delays and, and what that means. Um, yes, I can respond to that, Councillor, through the chair. Um, there, there is no change to the deed as it currently stands, Councillor. So the deed has a requirement for us to um, deliver um, key projects under the deed for the east, west and north, south bikeways by um, June uh, 2021, um, June 30, 2021. So that still exists as, as currently stated in the deed. Um, the, the financial treatment that we've applied um, in this Q3 report is simply to recognise that the money that is allocated for currently for the East West Bikeway, we um, predict will not be spent in the next three months. Um, therefore, we're treating it as, again, just re-timing that into next financial year. Um, as we currently are dealing with the, the latest decision of council and working through um, that as it relates to the East West Corridor. So again, it's, it's, one of, it's a case of we had predicted um, some work occurring in the next three months to June 30. We can now see um, and forecast quite accurately that that work is not going to occur as we deal with um, Council's current decision on that, but we expect it to uh, roll into next year. On the Okay, so just to be clear, it, it's um, not happening uh, this financial year as a result of the Council decision um, that was uh, passed um, recently. So does, but wasn't it part of the deed that the, that the money had to be spent this financial year? I mean, I thought we had to be getting a move on with that. Uh, through the chair, the, the deed only corresponds to next financial year uh, in terms of the completion of the deed and the funding allocation. So, um, and currently we are, we are just simply dealing with um, an east-west route that is, is undecided at this point in time. So until such time as we can um, decide on that, we can move forward. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's a holding pattern because of that, that paralysis. I, I, can, I can understand that. I guess, um, yeah, my, my concern is um, I'd, um, I'd like to see something, you know, something happening there, but that's not a fault of administration. That's an issue for the, um, for the elected body. So I'll keep um, prosecuting that. Um, through council. All right, thank you um, very much. That's um, helpful background, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, have the Lord Mayor next, and you're live. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Um, I think, uh, thank you for that explanation. So very clear that the retimed projects are what we would normally be talking about in carry, as carry forwards. Uh, so none of those projects are lost. It's just a, a timing in terms of expenditure. And most of the ones is my understanding that we wouldn't be able to deliver them in the next two months anyway, uh, due to a whole raft of reasons. But um, uh, but the delivery is, uh, is just rescheduled. Um, I just want to uh, say a big thank you to um, to Claire and the team for the uh, for the not only the um, information but the actually the way that the report has been presented. Um, I know there's only a few of you that have worked through the financial reports over the last few years, but uh, this is the clearest, most transparent that the information has been presented to us. Um, in in a, a very long time, and um, uh, I found it really easy to read. I found it really easy to understand um, what the adjustments were, had been prioritised. Um, as David said, uh, in audit, um, the indicators, which on page 15, which gives you a really great snapshot that we can interrogate and really understand what's happening on that dashboard is going to be brought forward. Um, and there's further discussion that needs to be had, of course, around those indicators. Um, but I just really wanted to say thank you to you and the team. Um, the individual projects, I think a lot of the, um, mm, let's have a look, misunderstanding of some of how those um, projects were funded and things such as the homelessness project that was um, misinterpreted in the media today. Um, as a counselling, our support of homelessness, which was was not, it was very difficult. If we've got a motion that is very clear in its direction as to how that money can be spent, and it can't be spent that way, but I, I'm pretty sure that that's going to be attended to in the next uh, council meeting. Um, it simply is that the way that it, it, it the, the way that it has been allocated, the administration can't spend it on something else because we've been very directive in terms of it has to be a matched funding project. So um, I will leave it to our good colleagues to make those changes. Um, I think also uh, just going back, the, the, the main things, um, David, that we highlighted in order was uh, really about making sure that the information was clear enough that we could, um, as, a, as a council, be able to ask really direct questions and. Um, that the information was presented in such a way that, um, as you said, with those indicators up front, we can have really good discussion around anything that is in those traffic lights that um, causes us any uh, angst or uh, any concerns. Um, uh, so thank you. And um, in terms of the individual projects, um, I know there's been a lot of work done by the team to put forward their best advice, and then it's up to uh, councillors to make any uh, amendments to those um, carry forwards or uh, uh, reprioritisation as we get into chambers next week. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Martin. Oh, thank you. Um, and look, I have uh, questions for David, mm -hmm. questions for Claire, and a couple of comments that I wish to make. Um, uh, first of all, uh, for David, um, look, thank you um, uh, for, for the role that the Audit Committee has played in the last few years, but particularly for insisting on some changes to the manner in which uh, reports were presented so that elected members would be able to understand them uh, much more clearly. Um, you did mention, however, at Audit Committee last week that you were concerned that these reports were still lacking in some key information that ought to be a bit further forward. Can you tell me specifically what it was? Uh, yeah, happy to do that. Um, there hasn't been time to obviously work on that bef between Friday and uh, the papers going out for you tonight. But uh, it, um, what I was suggesting that is that we probably need a, one more um, upfront page that, that goes, uh, that analyzes key uh, lines in the um, in the profit and loss statement or you know, income and, and key expenditure lines as well as capital projects that compares what the current forecast is for the 
financial year against your original budget that you agreed back 12 months ago. Uh, yep. and, and almost just a, just a single line explanation that says, you know, um, for example, car parking revenue down by $10 million primarily due to COVID and then almost a cross reference to where you can find more detail in the actual, in this report. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that there's a, some, almost a traffic light version at that level. Um, is an up, upfront document that would go alongside of that one that's on page 15, which is the the 10 year long term financial plan. So that's that was something we discussed on Friday. Um, clearly, we couldn't do that, deliver that in in a day, but um, that would be something we'd be uh, we'll work with administration on um, making some suggestions, or they they'll perhaps have a first crack at that, and we'll we'll work with them. Uh, to refine that one so that it is, is something that um, will again help you just focus in on where the questions need to be because we're really keen to see um, the elected member body to, to to sort of hone in on where the where the discussion needs to be around finances um, we, we, we're keen to see that ultimately you make the decisions you make as a elected member body around your budgets and where you spend on projects has a clear bearing on, on on what you look like financially this year and in the next 10. But that that was really the point that um, it's, I really think this is, you know, 80 or 90% of the way there, Philip. I think it's a much improved document, um, but I've just, I'd help like to see us get that last 10% so that it's a bit more, uh, even more um, guiding to you, I guess. Yeah, yeah, of course. And if it improves our understanding by 10%, that's a... That's huge, correct, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and look, just one final thing, because it's often uh, raised uh, at uh, uh, meetings by uh, others. Um, the Audit Committee doesn't prospectively review strategies. Uh, your role is the retrospective one, is it not? That is to say, this is the way we think this should be reported. Um, my question is, you're not directly approving our strategic policies in regard to financial management. Uh, no, um, that's not our role to to set your strategy or to approve your strategy. Uh, your response, it's the responsibility of elected members to set the strategy and responsibility of the administration to implement the strategy according to um, what the elected members suggest or direct. Um, we, we, I guess, in a sense, we do, um, we, we, when it comes to setting things like, for example, your budget, uh, we would look at things like your um, key budget parameters, like, um, we, you know, for example, uh, what, what uh, rate increases you may or may not have, uh, the kind of uh, what basis, uh, CPI basis is you're using, whether it's the LG CPI or CPI or other indicators, what some of your strategies are around level of debt and things like that, that we would provide some commentary on, do we support those um, key drivers for your budget? Um, but it's not for us to say, you know, you should do this project or not do this project. I think one of the things that we do do that we should be doing though is continue to make you aware that decisions you make will have a bearing on your financial outcome. And, and um, you know, over the last couple of years, we've had some fairly major deficits and that may not be a sustainable position to have um, and will have a long-term effect um, uh, on think levels of borrowing, for example, uh, and your capacity to do other projects in the future. So that's really where our role is, is to, um, to assist you in in understanding what the implications are of your decisions, but they're your decisions. Good, thank you for that. Um, uh, and thank you again, David. Um, if, if I could um, uh, ask a couple of questions of the administration of Claire. Now, this is the QF3 report. And um, how many weeks was the impact of COVID-19 apparent on our financial position? during this quarter? Um, oh gosh, when was it? March, so. 
Two, two and a bit weeks, two, two to three weeks. Okay. Um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm having a bit of trouble and I'm hoping you can help me uh, because the report talks about business enterprises um, sustaining losses of the order of nine, nine and a half million dollars. And I can't talk about it because they are in the confidential documents that come in another part of this meeting. But I'll be stuffed if I can find nine and a half million dollars. Um, is some of this already losses that were entrenched in the financial year before COVID? Uh, no, um, sorry, Councillor, if I can just help you. It's, it's QF3 taking into account actuals through to March, but also through to June. So there's still some assumptions in here. There are still okay. some, some assumptions. So are the assumptions built on the confidential documents that we can't talk about that come later on or some other formula? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm muted. Um, sorry, councillor, can you just ask that again? Is it, are you referring to... Uh, hey, I'm just trying to get a feel for it. I mean, looking, looking at the figures that are contained in the confidential part, uh, w when you extrapolate those figures to the balance of the financial year, it's very hard for me to come up with those figures. And so I'm asking, is there some other formula that's being used uh, apart from the impact in those few weeks where there was COVID-19? Is it a, an extrapolation built on something else or is it, is it a direct calculation on those things? It's, it's based on what we're currently experiencing. So, and that, there is a, so if I could talk to a non-confidential sort of revenue impact such as expiations, um, that is um, what we're currently experiencing. And into QF4 or, or solely on QF3? To the end of the financial year. Okay, fine. Nice. And th there is no information in the documents about parking and expiation um, uh, revenue that I can see. Have I missed that somewhere? That is on street parking? Um, is there um, talks to parking and on-street expiations, net reduction of 4.2 million. Yeah, no, I understand that, but I mean a graph so that we can see what uh, the circumstances were through January, February, so on. Yeah, so those graphs, I think, were shown to you through some of the CEO briefings. Okay, okay, no, that's fine. Um, and just to clear up a couple of things for me, uh, the Lord Mayor talks about projects being carried forward the projects that are re-time reprioritized are not carry forwards in the sense that we are used to. Um, it is just carrying the project forward in terms of our intention to complete it, is it? That's correct. Okay. And um, also just in respect of the, um, uh, the projects, I'm a bit confused about that um, because we, we talk about um, um, and in fact, the Lord Mayor said um, in media on Friday that we're just reprioritizing things and we'll uh, do most of them in the first few months of the uh, 2021 financial year. But just looking at the document uh, and I think page 16 or 18, um, yeah, I think it's page 17, uh, they suggest that the infrastructure reprioritization will form the basis also of the 2021 financial year. Um, does that mean because uh, you know the asset sustainability ratio is almost identical in the coming financial year to the current financial year that in fact a lot of things won't be completed in 2021? So, Councillor, um, one of the things that um, is a piece of work that um, I'll be working with Council on is this idea of a four-year rolling asset renewal and enhancement program. So, one of the challenges we've had as an organisation um, is um, managing community expectation around delivery of a lot of our infrastructure projects. 
um, because we've tended um, over the last few years to look at those on an annual basis. Um, Clinton and the team um, have been doing um, a lot of work um, to um, assess the condition of our assets um, and that will come through to you to build in um, a financially sustainable way to maintain the assets for the city. Um, so in terms of, you know, impacts over one or two years, um, you have a legal requirement to have 10 year infrastructure and asset management plans and obviously a requirement to have a 10 year um, uh, funding plan, uh, long term financial plan as well. Um, so these impacts often do flow over more than one or two years um, in terms of uh, reprioritizing. Um, on the 26th of May, we'll bring in um, all the projects um, that are, are within this report. I should just also say that um, this financial year, Council also um, asked us to bring into that thinking for next financial year, I think it's around another $5 million worth of infrastructure projects. So based on what the full quantum is currently sitting on your plate, and based on what we think the revenue um, and your income looks like, We'll be working with you to map that out, um, you know, over the um, coming, um, uh, so that you can deliver timely um, infrastructure over the coming coming months. And so you may well decide um, that based on uh, the level of funding that you have, that you might want to do less. You may decide that actually you're committed to all these projects that um, you have endorsed over the um, past few years, and then may require, um, you know, additional borrowings to complete. Um, or, you know, there's various ways that we can work with you to, um, um, you know, deliver uh, what's on your agenda. I, look, I, I thank you for that. Uh, uh, but it, it would be right for me to assume, based on the documentation before us, that the reprioritised infrastructure program will go over 2019, 20 and 2021. W would that be a reasonable thing for me to speculate on the documents available? It's your speculation, Councillor. Um, you know, you may decide you want to do it all in one year. We go out and we, you know, build and employ another hundred, you know, another hundred people to deliver it. So, um, you know, yeah, it depends. You know, it all depends on the level of funding that we have um, and um, councillors um, prioritising or the level of commitment to the timing of the de delivery of these projects. Okay, and just uh, um, a final uh, question. Um, I note in the document there's an insistence that the central market arcade redevelopment will occur as scheduled and that the 88 O'Connell Street development is on track. Um, uh, but, but I can't see anything in the documents that shows that um, $54 million for the central market arcade development, that is the $27 million sale of the air rights, plus the $27 million uh, or 28 and a half million construction cost. And I can't see any receipt in Point there. of order, please. Point of clarification. Oh, sorry, point of clarification. It's not $54 million. It's $27.4 million. It has never been $54 million. There's no contract for $54 million. Um, the amount of money that that project is, is $27.4 million plus the contingency. Oh, well, I, I just read the document differently. It says 54 million, so I've obviously misread it. Um, but look, I, you know, I can't see that transaction anywhere. And that's the point, I can't see that transaction and I can't see the 88 O'Connell Street transaction anywhere in the long-term financial plan. Is there a reason why they are not in there when there is such a commitment in the documents to proceed with those developments? I just went through. Um, because it's uh, not this financial year, so uh, Central Market Arcade has been built into our long-term financial plan. Um, so the revenue associated with that as well as the expenditure, so that's embedded within the long-term financial plan. That, that is in the document in front as of As well as okay. 88 O'Connell, yeah. Okay, which, uh, which years are they in, please, sorry? And perhaps if you could point me to the page, that would help me a lot. Uh, page 31, Councillor. Page 31. Thank you very much. Um, uh, look, uh, the only comment that I have at this stage, having asked all the questions that I dare ask, um, is that, look, I, I'm a bit disappointed also that um, we have been running uh, what are unsustainable uh, actual operating deficits uh, for the previous two financial years. And 
that we will have a very similar um, uh, operating deficit in the uh, current financial year. Um, in total, you know, we're getting close to 60 million and um, that's fairly similar to the, uh, the level of debt we have, not far behind anyway. A and I can't help feeling that all of the savings measures uh, that are being uh, introduced, um, postponing projects, reprioritizing, retiming, is in effect, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that our ratepayers uh, will regret. Um, you know, there are projects that are um, hard fought, hard won, uh, which are now to one side for whatever period it is. Uh, and there will be those who say, well, you know, if you'd have managed your house better, you might have been able to do those things. So I am disappointed about that, um, but perhaps um, uh, more on that um, next week. Um, when, uh, and I'm assuming we'll get the, uh, the readjusted papers with the suggested uh, changes, or this is uh, all we'll get for this quarter. Um, I can check with the team if we're able um, quickly to pull together a, pretty much a sort of like a profit and loss view of, um, of, um, of the finances, then we can do that um, and send that out to you separately. Um, the challenge was when the audit committee recommended it, um, we'd already published um, pretty much the papers um, for you tonight. So um, I can certainly work to get that done and commit to sending that out prior to next Tuesday's council meeting. Well, thank you for that. And, and look, offline, could, could you point me in the direction of where those calculations are on the long-term financial plan on the page number you mentioned? Uh, that would be really helpful. Of course, yeah, I can um, do that. And Councillor, I'm always available to answer any sort of detailed questions that you might have. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Noel is next. Um, and very much also thank you for the reports, etc. And yes, they are quite easy to read and uh, I do appreciate that greatly because um, it helps us to scan it. Um, now, just as a couple of uh, uh, questions to, to clarify here, we're on page five, we've got the efficiency and service reviews and there was a $210,000 uh, uh, you know, saving there. And I'm just thinking, uh, if we're talking about efficiency and service, um, the, the saving is made uh, in, in areas that is more about reviewing the service rather than necessarily improvements that we can make that help us to uh, you know make become more sustainable um, so that uh, what was the uh, you know what was that say the two hundred ten thousand dollars relate to um thank you councillor that's relating to um, a resource cost um and so we've been able to use in-house resources to resources to progress that work um and so um we don't need that resource Okay, um, just so to help to help we get understand because with all the some some projects are in the cross being retimed or finalised or reprioritised, and I look at the Grove Street and West Terrace Morvet Morvet Street uh, um, you know, work, and there is in the retimed is a greater sum, uh, and uh, you also have it in finalised uh, with a, with a negative. Now, is that, is that uh, because obviously, so how does that relate? So we're retiming the whole lot and the money that we would have had in the finalised goes back under the retime? Clinton's on his way. <laughs> Page seven. seven. Thanks, Councillor, through the chair. Um, so double good news on this one, um, elected members. So we've, we've actually gone to tender on the Grote Street project and uh, managed to bring in the project what looks like under budget. So we've actually presented some savings, uh, which is where you'll see um, that as being finalised. So that's actually just to finalise the financial treatment of the savings. And we've then re-timed the project to commence the project to manage cash flow, um, commencing it into the new financial year. Okay. So the next one on page eight, is the event infrastructure uh, Rundle Park. And again, you've had a, a bit of, well, nearly $600,000 saving. Now, uh, does that impact our ability afterwards uh, for people to use that space uh, uh, and for us to, uh, to achieve you know, a bit, uh, some income, extra income out of that? 
or what does that, uh, that actually relate to? That project was delayed through um, requirements to, through, I think it was SA Power Network. So we've been waiting a long time um, for SA Power Networks to get that infrastructure um, in the ground. Um, and then we were delayed by making sure um, the event season wasn't impacted as well. So, so it was the, still delivered by next Yeah, it will still be delivered by the start of the next major event season. Good. And just a quick, on, on page nine, you've got the, the transport retimed and reprioritized. Describe to me what transport is. Clinton's on his way back. <laughs> <laughs> It's the renewals. It's in the renewal bucket, so it would be um, in relation uh, to roads. roads, I'd say. Uh, so infrastructure for, for transport. Okay. Sorry, Councillor. Yeah, um, through the chair, that's just in relation to roads. And again, um, it is work that we have finalised. Is that the work that yeah, you were referring to? Oh, there's some retimed. Yeah. As well. Yeah, okay. Yep. So that's seven hundred thousand dollars worth of essentially road resurfacing renewals that will retime into the next financial year. Yep. Not necessary to, to be done straight away. Yeah. This is one last comment and, and, and it was thank you for the Councillor Martin for, uh, uh, you know, for asking about the major projects because I mean I do appreciate that we, we're, we're still looking at those to, to progress them because obviously those are the drivers that will help us to um, you know weather or at least start to get in uh, incomes etc that helps us to weather the, the future and and uh, in a rain in our overdrafts etc and our expenditures but otherwise thank you um it was entertaining reading thank you franz councillor sims thank you um Chair, and look, um, just some uh, general um, comments uh, by way of feedback. I guess one of the things that concerns me um, around the, the position that we're in is that a lot of the um, projects that are uh, community oriented um, have been um, held back, and you know, things like the uh, East West Bikeway, um, things like the pedestrian um, safety project, which has been well, basically on the back burner since I first ran for council and has been discussed for a very long period of time. And I think that's a reality of some of the decisions that have been made over, you know, the last few years. In particular, I, I do point to the Gawler Place um, redevelopment. I think it's regrettable that $20 million was spent on that project. And now we find ourselves in a situation where we're not being able to progress things like pedestrian safety initiatives um, and other smaller projects, but ones that are really impactful and important for the community. And I just urge councillors to keep that in mind in future when we're addressing these kind of issues. Um, but of course, that was a decision of the previous council, um, but it's one that has had significant implications for this council um, as we've dealt with this crisis. And, and I'm certainly not suggesting anybody, you'd have to have a crystal ball to have seen this coming. However, I do think in terms of how we plan going forward, that those decisions have contributed um, to the difficulty that we find ourselves in. Um, the other point that I would make is that I think we need to have a discussion as a council about how we address long-term issues around revenue. Um, and I think it'd be really good for us to maybe have a, a day workshop at some time on a weekend to look at some of these things in a bit more detail. I know that um, there wasn't support for the idea of a designated finance committee, but maybe we could have a Saturday workshop or something like that when it's safe for us to meet face to face um, to just work through some of these things and see what ideas people have because you know, we can make some cuts around the edges to key community projects, but there's some big, I think big picture challenges that we've got. Um, and I'm concerned that, you know, if we go too far down the path of cutting out community initiatives, um, that uh, that's going to make the recovery more difficult um, here in Adelaide because, you know, things like access to cycling, a support for vulnerable members of the community and so on, those sorts of things are going to be really, really important when we deal with the recovery. So I just wanted to put that, that idea out there. That maybe that's something that could be 
um, investigated uh, maybe a day planning workshop to talk through um, some of these things um, in, in a bit more detail. Um, and finally, I wanted to um, acknowledge Councillor Martin's work on the audit committee. I know he hasn't been involved in this process, but he has been involved with the audit committee previously. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm always appreciative of the questions and the detail, uh, detailed knowledge that he has. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that given he was recently removed from the committee. Um, but thanks everybody for your um, work on this. I think um, it's been a useful discussion, but I think there is a bit more work to do from my perspective in terms of ensuring that we don't leave people behind in our recovery and ensuring that we don't have um, the community um, carrying the can uh, for this recovery um, and missing out on, on projects that I think are going to be really important. Thank you. Members, are there any further questions or comments to be made? Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want some just clarification, just um, I'm sure you've gone through it, but everything that you presented to us here, we're talking about savings that we can make until the end of June, correct? Correct. Okay, so there's no there is no indication that we're going to, you know, all the um, cuts that we've made here or that we're considering here, um, that we're going to forego anything to do with the community. It's just a ways of being able to balance our books until the end of June. So I don't think we. Uh, I, I just think that Councillor Sims just you know, alerted the fact that, that we're looking at cutting things. And I just don't think that we're looking at the long term of cutting any of these community services. And I'm, I understand that, that you're bringing forward, forward to us, which is great piece of work. And I, and I know there's been a lot of thank yous tonight, but I guess, you know, we can express how much easier it has been to follow. So I do thank you for it. And, and uh, I do thank the fact that you've taken a lot of things into consideration to where we could possibly make those cuts until the end of June. Um, I do agree with Councillor Sims on one issue, though, um, is that, you know, what are the long term issues that we have in regarding to revenue? I think that that needs to be explored a lot more. But um, but I do agree with that, that. But I don't think that we're anyone's ever considering of not having the bikeways of not providing for the community. Um, so I don't think that's a forefront of anyone's thinking here. Um, so I do thank you as well for the clarity of bringing that forward and um, and of course, you know, these are some things that we have to uh, consider further, um, but I would probably like to catch up with you offline as well on some of the issues, uh, some of the recommendations that you put in forward, if I can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kouros. Members? If not, I've just got a quick question, just if we could uh, elaborate on the um, appearance of the master plans in this. And I think it was $232 of, um, um, of expenditure being moved into the next financial year. Could we just get some um, information on that, please? So Clinton can just clarify, because Shanti um, held a workshop with you guys recently, so I'll just get Clinton to just confirm. Thanks, Deputy Little Mayor, through you. Um, that's absolutely correct. So we've had um, uh, initial investigation work done and we've developed those action plans. Um, the action plans have resulted in a number of uh, quick wins and short term actions for each of the main streets. Um, we've achieved that with a remaining budget of 232,000, I think it is in the report. Um, that money will be retimed into next financial year, which will give us the opportunity in the next couple of months to come back to committee and council to discuss those um, quick wins and short-term actions and put together a plan um, that council can hopefully endorse and enable us to uh, to get some of those actions done early in the new year. Thank you. And it's it's not so much the case that you're actually pushing that back. It's the case that we just haven't spent that money in this financial year. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Well, none of it's at risk at all. You know, our main streets are going to get the uh, TLC. That'll be up to council to endorse that. Yeah. Yes. 
Right. Okay, uh, Councillor Martin, I see your hand is up again. I'll give you one more question because we did give you the better part of 20 minutes before. Well, it's very kind of you, Chair. Thank you. I'm feeling very kind today. Well, that's, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, it's a quality that uh, I'd like to encourage. Um, uh, look, I, I'm uh, just a bit confused still. Um, if the money has been withdrawn from projects, whether it's Main Street or whatever, it has to be the subject of a fresh budget bid. Is that correct? Or is this, in fact, as the Lord Mayor called it, a carry board? It depends. So if a project was only um, allocated one year's worth of funding, then it wouldn't um, be necessarily um, considered as part of next year's budget. Um, so, for example, um, the uh, cultural hub for um, Hutt Street, um, we haven't spent any money this year at QF2. I almost gave the money up because I put the team under pressure to say you're not going to deliver. Um, at Q3 now, we are still giving the money up because we haven't been able to find an appropriate lease. That project was actually scoped, um, it was new last year, scoped for five years. So that would form the basis of next year's planning. So it depends if the, um, through your business plan and budget and through those projects, remember those one pages we give you, um, it usually shows whether it's a one year um, project or longer term projects. So it does depend on um, whether it's an ongoing project or not. And can I just clarify next financial year, um, am I to believe from the documents that were presented to us that the, the budget process has been delayed and the approval of the 2021 financial year uh, expenditure won't go to council until in fact the fifth month of the new financial year that is november is that correct no that's incorrect um so okay. that, slide, that slide that i showed you at the start um under the ceo update i will send that out so what what we will require from council is a very um quick um in what we're calling an interim budget to get you through the first six months of uh, the next financial year with a broader, more deeper dive budget for you to consider in November. So in June, you will still need to endorse your rates, your income, your fees and charges, your user charges, um, as well as the high level expenditure, as well as your infrastructure, as well as your projects, as well as your renewals. So a lot of that um, work we had already done and started um, with you through till February, um, and we'll pick that back up for you in May. Uh, 26th of May, and we'll work really quickly to have something for you to consider by the end of June to enable uh, 1st of July for us to have an interim budget and then continue to work with you in the coming months for your November budget as well. So there's uh, sort of, yeah, various yep. steps in the way, but I'll, I'll make sure you get that slide. You can have a look at those touch points. Oh, that's great. That's great. And I look forward to us approving all of these projects in June. That's great. Thank you. Very welcome, Councillor Martin. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment. And the first one, I'm not sure if David is still on the line, but I just wanted to thank David for his work in getting us these. Uh, oh, there you are. Hi. Still here, sorry. Um, uh, just to thank you for getting uh, these reports tidied up um, and presented like this. It's far, far more workable. Um, and particularly, as the Lord Mayor said, the financial indicators, which um, of course, we all sort of broadly understand, but seeing them next to one another on the same page and for the long term financial plan for that time span is, is very, very valuable. Um, and so thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was thank you to Claire, whose um, uh, leadership in this portfolio has, I think, worked wonders. Um, uh, and I, I reckon based on what we've received, um, it's very, very encouraging. Um, uh, and it's very, very clear uh, that we know um, where we're at because I feel that when we first came on, notwithstanding there was a lot to get up to speed on, um, that myself and other councillors who are more financially literate than I um, also struggled to make heads and tails of it. So um, I just want to commend um, you, Claire, and your teams for the work that's, that's being done um, uh, across the board. Um, in order for us to work out what, what the damage is um, and what we can do to assist 
um, our rate payers. And on that, I, I just wanted to say um, as well that it is, it is disappointing that we aren't able to help our rate payers as much um, as the other levels of government are helping um, uh, their or their citizens and taxpayers and what have you. Um, obviously, we are constrained by our taxable base, uh, which is a lot, lot less than state, mm -hmm. of course, federal government. Um, and so we need to appreciate that. However, I do think um, that had the council been in a stronger position previously, we actually would have been in a position to offer support to our ratepayers. Um, I do think, and I'm of the firm view that this council has been running far too fat for far too long. I think if we had been more careful previously, um, we would be able to offer support. And I'm thinking about things like um, even going as far back as the as the the windfall we received from the Wingfield dump um, uh, that ran into the millions upon millions of dollars, um, uh, I have nothing tangible to point at and say that's what we got for that money. And uh, I'm sure it was uh, spent what seemed to be carefully at the time, but I guess hindsight is 2020, um, and we certainly can't see it now. Uh, infrastructure as well, the renewals. Um, uh, a lot of it looks very nice, notwithstanding many members I know have issues with the design manual and the fact that we are painting the city grey in a lot of senses, both in Victoria Square and Rundle Mall. Um, those things are very expensive and then of course we've got cost blowouts such as, such as Gawler Place. The bikeway as well um, uh, looks nice now, it was very hard to get there. Uh, again, very, very expensive and I'm yet to see any significant economic uplift for the ratepayers that it's meant to serve. So. Um, I just think we need to be mindful of that going forward. I, I'm very um, eager to see the work that is going to be done um, as far as operational savings. I think that's where we need to go. Obviously, according to the report that we've got in the uh, oncoming financial year, we are uh, still very much in the red and, and the deficit is going to be larger. Um, and so that means uh, we do need to be very careful with our ratepayers' money to ensure and make sure that we have a city at the, end, at the other end of this crisis and so that we can support the recovery that's needed and get people back into the city, back into our businesses and keep going for growth, um, which we have been doing previously, but we really, really need to ramp up that work. So um, I'll just leave you with that positive, negative, positive um, sandwich there. Uh, uh, I, you know, I do think we're going in the right direction with this. So I again, commend the team um, and I thank councillors for, as well, their ongoing engagement in this process through the committee and, of course, um, as the Lord Mayor would say, through council as well. So um, uh, with that, I uh, would like to thank you again, David, for coming along and we look forward to engaging with you more thoroughly um, uh, over the course of, of this, uh, uh, I guess, crisis. Um, uh, and we'll happily welcome you back with open arms because you've um, definitely offered some clarity uh, in this regard. So thank you. Um, Members, we will now move on to item six, uh, one, which is the exclusion of the public to consider in confidence. Um, I'll sign off. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. And I will seek a mover and a seconder for six one. I have Councillor Noll and a seconder in the Lord Mayor. Councillor Noll, do you wish to speak? Lord Mayor? No. Excellent. Members? Is that, is, that a, is that a yes you wish to speak or yes you're going to allow us to proceed smoothly, Councillor Martin? Uh, I, I'm going to allow you to proceed smoothly and just observe that this information should be in the public realm. Um, extrapolations of it are there. Why can't we put it in the public realm? Thank you, Councillor Martin. You need a little button to press with a pre-record for that, I reckon. Any other comments, members? There being none, we wait, wait, wait. Can I just um can I just can unmute to... yourself, sorry. Okay, I've done it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Martin, absolutely understand um, your ongoing feedback around trying to have as much information as possible. You'll see this report is in the old format, um, not in the new format. So we didn't get time to be able to do um, this differently. Um, but I'm working um, with Tom um, and the team to be able to try and build a report that can be more um, uh, considered in public. So um, that is the eventual aim. Um, but obviously a lot of that will depend on the level of detail council will need. 
um, and how much of um, commercial in confidence we have. But the aim is to absolutely get there. I just couldn't uh, deliver it for you this time. Thank you, Claire. Councillor Sims, was your hand up to speak on this one? No, I had my hand up to correct some of the incorrect statements that you made in your summing up, um, but that's all right. I will uh, follow that um, up um, in the council chamber, but it's not correct to say that we're a bloated um, organisation, Councillor Hyde. Um, I think... No debate. Need to Thank you, Rob. Anything else on this? Sorry, Rob. Anything else on this one, members? None, I'll go back to Councillor Noel to sum up. Summed up, we put that to the vote. Those in favour, those against. Is that, yeah, there we go, excellent. Thank you, uh, members. All right, and uh, with that, I'll ask any participants not associated with item 7-1 to please now leave this Zoom meeting uh, whilst the committee considers the, considers the next item. Um, uh, and of course, 